everybody. This is Mark Hinderleiter. I am here with my sidekick, Mark Johnson. Uh, we're trying to brand ourselves. Uh, maybe we're Marky Mark and the, the Boomer Bunch. <laughs> uh, the Funky Bunch was branded a long time ago. So anyway, welcome. Um, this is, uh, I don't know, the fifth or sixth in a continuing discussion called Executive Leadership Series. Uh, and we're just having uh, really great conversations about how to lead through this crisis that none of us have ever seen before. It's truly uh, a black swan event. Uh, just And so we're just, we're all trying to figure it out and, and kind of what uh, Mark and I are trying to do is just share kind of what we're learning from, from each other, from other folks, from our readings, from our clients, and just, uh, and just, uh, try to provide value to our listeners. So that that really is the purpose that you see on this screen to provide an online venue, uh, which is where we live now, right? For business leaders to discuss the most pressing topics of the of the day, and it, it's like we have two black swan events. Uh, uh, one is uh, obviously the COVID crisis, but related to that is this. Uh, this economic hit where I read this morning that we've got like 20% unemployment right now. We're approaching the 1930s depression mm. era. And so these are just once in a lifetime uh, combination of events. So uh, we're doing whatever we can to kind of just talk through some of this stuff and try to provide value. Um, and so today's topic uh, is leadership lessons uh, for the COVID crisis. Um, and, you know, the discussion approach, if this is your first time, um, we're going to just really have a 20 minute or so presentation, 25 minute. And then at the end, we'll open it up to questions. In the meantime, um, uh, there's the chat uh, feature. So feel free to, uh, uh, to put a, a comment or a question in the chat feature. And my, my buddy, Mark Johnson will, uh, We'll monitor those and we'll uh, deal with them at the end. So, um, uh, Mark, my uh, uh, Marky Mark and the Boomer <laughs> Bunch buddy, is uh, Mark's uh, been around the block a few times like I have. He's an executive technology advisor. Uh, he's a president of his own company, Xtree, uh, in Austin, Texas. Uh, and like, uh, like myself, Mark has been a corporate guy for a long time. He was a senior VP and uh, chief information officer for global companies, for billion dollar Fortune 500 companies with over 100,000 people, so mega companies. And the other side of that, he's, he's really kind of been involved in startups, including his own. So that's a pretty cool uh, combination of experiences. Uh, so Mark uh, is really, really not only tech savvy, but, but very business savvy. Um, and that's kind of me at the bottom. Uh, I've been a, I was a executive, or I mean, I was a senior VP of HR for a billion dollar company. And now I'm a senior, a, uh, an executive coach uh, and leadership development uh, practitioner. Uh, and so today uh, we have a, a presenter who's not named Mark. Uh, his name is Rod Branch, and uh, Rod's career uh, is uh, kind of similar to mine. We're career, uh, uh, for most of our time, career uh, HR guys. Um, so currently, Rod's the owner and founder, consultant, researcher, author, public speaker, and he's he, Rod has an engineering background, and so he has uh, some patents, which I think is cool. So 40 years of business experience, uh, starting out as an engineer, and then 25 of that is uh, in HR. So he's got one of those brains that's both left and right brain. Um, uh, Mark's been an engineer um, uh, up in Alaska. He's been a lobbyist in Washington, DC. So some really rich experiences. Like myself, Rod's been the chief HR officer for close to a billion dollar company in the uh, energy uh, sector. Uh, 25 years of HR experience, public and private. Uh, to include some big, big companies. Um, and so uh, Mark has degrees uh, from engineering technology, Oklahoma State University, good football country, and uh, also a master's degree in global human resource management from the University of Liverpool in the UK. And I know Mark is very kind of connected in this uh, 
South Texas HR community. So today's presenter is Rod Branch. So Rod, thank you for joining us. Um, you got the ball uh, on five le leadership lessons for today's COVID crisis. Thank you for yeah. joining us, Rob. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really believe in what you guys are doing. I've learned a lot from tuning in and, and being a, uh, a listener, and I'm privileged to be a presenter today. So I want to start out by saying that, you know, for maybe centuries and maybe, maybe millennial, uh, leadership has been important. It's been very important. And yet, now it's sort of imperative. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Leadership, one of the main leadership purposes, according to Buckingham and Goodall in, in Nine Lies About Work, which is a well-researched book, is to remove fear, to remove the fear of the unknown in people. And there's a lot of that right now. There yeah. is a lot of unknown and uncertainty and angst and stress and all of that stuff. And so leadership is necessary just to get people on an even keel so they can do the work. And so that's kind of the premise of everything we're gonna talk about today is how necessary leadership is and, and what have we learned out of this shocking thing we've just come through and are still going through and I'm pretty sure we're not through with it for a while. But let's slide. So we've talked about emotional intelligence really since 1964 when the term was coined and it wasn't until 1995 when the book Emotional Intelligence came out that it really hit the map. And yes, we've given it lip service. It's been part of leadership presentations and it's been really cool to talk about. But when we, when we talk about uh, empathy towards employees, we're really talking about emotional intelligence. And there's nothing like tuning in to a broadcast as a leader and seeing your folks in their natural habitat. It's going to one of the natural habit zoos and seeing it a little differently. Their kids are crawling on them. The dogs are barking when the UPS guy drives up with their delivery. And you develop a little bit of closeness through that. You get a, a window into their lives that you didn't have before. And I think it's brought us all a little bit closer. I think we've all sort of said to ourselves, wow, I didn't know this about that person or that about that person. And everybody's carrying around this Santa sack full of stuff on their back at work, but we really didn't see it until we saw into their homes when we started uh, doing this remote work. And I think it's been really I think it's important for leaders and when you see the statistic that's been out just in the last couple of weeks of the 14,000 I believe it was LinkedIn people that were surveyed the they said only 8% of those 14,000 8% said that their bosses were actually good listeners <laughs> that means 92 or not <laughs> uh, just doing the simple Aggie math here so you know what we've discovered through this is this connection that's required, the connection and the relationship that's required to get permission to be a leader has now had a bright light shone on it and it's very, very important. And we're moving, we're moving leadership important to imperative to remove that fear through this empathy and the connections that, that we've established. So that's what showing empathy is about. And I think it's one of, that's one of the biggest lessons out of this whole thing. Okay, next one. Okay, I am messing up here technically. You're good, oh. you're good there. Okay. So, you know, if I just ask everybody that's on the call right now to complete this sentence, you know, had I known, had I known, and fill in the blank with whatever the known is, you know, whether it's your personal life or food deliveries or, or invalid parents who can't leave their homes or, or, you know, you're working remotely for the first time, you're giving patients online. Had I known, I would have, fill in the blank, which kind of says to all of us, none of us were completely com prepared for this kind of pandemic, for this kind of social disconnection, uh, both from work and the people at work and also from our families. Um, we just weren't prepared very well. And just imagine, and this came up on one of your terrific uh, uh, podcasts that we had recently about, about, um, you know, how do we get prepared? How do we do business continuity plans? And there were some great, great lessons in that. But what if we had a cyber attack at the same time? These out there decides that they're gonna 
take terrorism to another level and they and they inflict us with some sort of virus and a cyber attack at the same time just imagine you know the the the, the cyber connection is how we did all of our grocery shopping and connection to people and work and all that stuff so i think better strategic planning going forward particularly involving the tech group and what do we do next time because i think we all know that this is a reality going forward and that there might be a legitimate uh, next time so better planning and being more prepared i think is the, the lesson out of that one so let's see if manage change uh, ibm put out some information i don't know how long ago I, I have the citing somewhere but it was ibm and they talked about the doubling of information that's out there and they talked about you know going through the 50s and 60s and the information was doubling every 10 15 years and bringing us all the way up to 2020, the prediction was that the knowable information in the world was doubling daily, doubling daily. That means there's a lot of information out there and our, our uh, human brains are reaching a point where we can't process the amount of information that we're getting. We're, have, we're gonna have to use all of the leverage that we can, artificial intelligence, um, data, uh, uh, data warehousing, uh, data analysis, all these things, all these tools that we're going to need to sort through this amount of data. And it's an example of how much change is out there and the speed of change. And, you know, we're no longer talking about change in terms of there's this serial group of milestones that are involved in our goals. We're going to get to this goal. We're going to get to this goal. We're going to get to this milestone. We're going to change this. When we're done with that, we're done changing that, we're gonna to move to the next thing. It's not like that. Now it's about managing continuous change and our orientation now has to be flexibility around being able to morph into the next new piece of data that changes the last thought that we just had. And we've gotta build in flexibility to everything that we do with our employees, how do we go to market, our customers, our supply chains, um, how many people are in business out there that had a supply chain that, that was uh, dependent on Chinese products coming in? You know, and that essentially got shut off. And if you were dependent solely on Chinese products and had no other sourcing, you were shut down. And so now people have to have their supply chain in terms of new change and how do we be prepared next time if these sources are cut, cut out. And, and what about my inventories? Maybe, maybe I need to have an inventory of products that I can weather an upset like that, or an inventory of supplies and, and parts, so that kind of thing. But the, the virus um, data morphed daily. We kept getting updates, and how many of us were watching multiple uh, updates a day on, on what do we need to be worried about, How's, how fast is it moving across the globe? All these things were happening uh, daily and giving us new information and new information about uh, whether we wear a mask when we into work, whether whether we wear a mask every day or every time we leave the house, or whether our parents should leave the house or not, and you know it's things like that that cause us to have different thoughts all through the day. So flexibility is the key, and you know thinking forward in this kind of situation before, if my business was was uh, dependent on travel or entertaining clients or supply chains and foreign sourcing and what would I do differently? So filling in the blank or what would I do differently next time is how we plan uh, for the next sort of pandemic sort of situation, whatever it is, maybe, maybe it's not a virus. But. So let's talk about trust in the next slide. So an interesting thing happened um, when we first started operating remotely. Um, there's a longer discussion about different leadership styles and different leadership types that people have. One of the ones is being a dominant person or a know-it-all, as Brene Brown would say. Um, and, and those people are control people. I'm going to stop just short of saying they're narcissists, but we all know many of them are. And so their way of sort of controlling these people that are suddenly out of their sight that they can't see right now is to set up, let's, let's set up a call at a.m. at noon and then maybe at five and it was really for the purpose of just seeing that you're at your desk and 
well, you get into the meeting and suddenly there's not a lot of substance to it and became sort of, hey, what are you working on or what's new? And, and then it died off pretty quickly. And, and, and the strategy, the distrust strategy shone through. It was obvious that they're just calling to make sure that I'm at my desk. Well, if you think about the disruption in people's lives and you see them in their, in their work environment with the kids crawling on them and the dogs barking and the UPS driver coming up and taking care of the parents and getting groceries and all those kinds of things, we understand that maybe some people in some jobs that allow it need the flexibility to do the work when they can do it at home. And that might mean, hey, um, I need this work done and I'm going to tell you how to do it. Or rather, how about you say, we need this work done. Here's the outcome. Here's the result that we need. And when would it work best for you to get that to me? I really need it by Friday. I don't care if you work from six in the evening until midnight, if that works better for you. And so we build in this employee ownership, how they get their work done. When you're that person who is casting doubt and mistrust about how they're doing their work or if they're doing that work, it weighs on the faithful people. The people who are out there working probably harder than they worked before and more hours than they worked before now are saying, okay, it looks like you don't trust me, that you're doubting me, that you doubt my work. On top of all of this Santa sack of stuff they have on their back in addition to this distrust. And so now we need to redouble. We need to double down on building trust, building relationships, building connections, and getting that engagement back in people, giving them ownership of how they get their work done. Not every job allows for a lot of that, but some jobs, in fact, we're finding many jobs actually do allow for a lot of that. And we wanna trust those people more to get the work done. The more we trust them, the more we give them more information, the more we establish relationships and connections, the more engagement we have, the more engagement we have, the less compliant worker we have, and the more committed worker we have. And we wanna move all of our leadership towards commitment. You get a lot more productivity out of committed employees. So let's talk about technology. Technology is, I will tell, um, I was not adept at Zoom calls. Yes, I could fumble my way through it and get on a call. And uh, now we're living by them. Not only are we living by them, we're having happy hour by them. We're connecting with our own families using it. We're, we're, we have our own family uh, happy hour once, uh, once or twice a month. I've got two kids in Seattle who've been locked down, obviously. Uh, one in Denver and, and one here, and we found that as a great tool. It's become more of a comfortable part of our life, and we're not scared by it uh, anymore. But think, if we didn't have the technology, if this had happened in the 50s or 60s, we'd be on the telephone, burning up the telephone with an operator plugging in lines to connect people to, to things. And now, now we were able to cut, conduct business, and you know, we could get uh, provisions. You have your, you have your food delivered from a restaurant, you have your food delivered from HEB or, or whatever a grocery store that you use. You check on your family. Uh, you can be entertained. You know, we have Netflix. Stock has gone through the roof, obviously. Um, but we're so dependent on it. And yet, and I'm glad Mark's on this call, and yet, when we're on those calls with a dozen people on it, when one person talks to the other out or sometimes the call gets completely dropped and so there's more work to be done to make it a much more robust avenue and medium for people to connect to each other you know why can't we hear other people talking at the same time um and 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 then there's actually an inclusion part of this too because if you have one of these dominating bosses who needs to say who needs to be the smartest person in the room and somewhat interrupts people when he interrupts people or she interrupts people, it cuts the other people out. You've just excluded that person, whether you intended to or not, just in the same way you would talk over them being at a table. But it feels more personal when you've just been cut off on the technology side. So there's more work to be done on the technology side before it's as robust as being in a conference room, uh, but we've discovered the value of it and the dependence on it that we have and we just pray that we have 
enough protections in there to avoid having some sort of cyber attack at the same time we're dealing with this pandemic thing, this crazy pandemic thing that's going on. So that's the five main lessons from the crisis, but I've got a bonus learning here that's for everyone, and it, and it, goes, it goes beyond leadership. I think it's also a part of leadership, and that's the gratitude and the charity side. It's a little bit about the empathy side that we, we started talking about, as, talking about as being sort of the core of all of all leadership, but you know, I th there are a number of people out there that are unemployed or grossly underemployed right now. They're stuck at home. Um, they don't have a live entertainment outlet. They're not seeing people very often, and yet these events have happened that have filled some of that gap. And it's it's the car parades for the people with answer and it's the celebrating birthdays and the signs in the yard and the anniversaries that are out there and people driving by and honking and holding up signs that happened on my birthday in the middle of all of this believe it or not uh, it, it was just a, a wonderful warm feeling to know that there was a way that we could do social distancing and still celebrate these things um, but more than that uh, I I play music for our neighborhood. I've done it now nine times. Uh, will be, I'm sorry, the, the ninth time will be Saturday night in an area where about a hundred different homes can, uh, can hear from their backyards uh, me playing music. And, and we turned, they wanted me and we turned into donating to the food bank. And it's so healing for me personally to know that I was able to do something from where I was sitting. To, to show some caring and show some gratitude and give back a little bit. And you feel like you've done something at the end of the day. And those people in those car parades, making the kids with cancer who've just come home from the hospital or somebody's had a 95th birthday or whatever it is, they've made it significant. I know the people in those cars felt good about what they were doing. And I think that should be part of our work life, part of our home life, and part of our humane approach to these kinds of situation like this for people to use their gifts uh, in the best way they can. So that's uh, my, my five lessons and then a, a little bonus lesson on the gratitude and charity. And I guess, uh, guys, if you've gotten any questions or you want to open it up somehow, do I need yeah, this? Yeah, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Mark, I think, we do we have a question out there in, the, in chat? We don't. We had some feedback on one of the uh, questions that Rod put out there. Uh, and one of the feedback was they wish they'd stocked up on toilet paper. So there's probably <laughs> uh, a lot of other things people wish they'd stocked up on as well. Uh, but I thought it was one of them that uh, one of the participants said that, that lessons learned that, that they wish they had. And probably not just toilet paper, food. You know, a lot of people, you, it's so easy, and especially in America, you can run to the grocery store and pick up whatever you want to immediately. So right. I, I think people will kind of change some of those habits on what they keep on hand. And business as well, as well as you pointed out, Rod. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, we, so we, we have this discussion a lot because it's, you know, I don't know, it's kind of fun because it's toilet paper, I guess. But, um, but, we're not using more toilet paper than we used to, whether we're at work or whether we're at home, we're using the exact same amount of toilet paper, <laughs> unless you're doing something else with it. <laughs> um, but paper towels, we're going through paper towels like nobody's business. And um, that, was the, <laughs> that was the item we worried about not having enough of because my wife's a nurse, so we wash our hands more than any family that I know uh, by requirement. Yeah. And, and it's better to use a paper towel and throw it away than to use an, a, a dish rag over and over to dry your hands. And yeah. so uh, it, was, it was the paper towel shortage that worried us the most. And so I was dispatched to, uh, to Costco at 7 o'clock in the morning to take advantage of my 60 and over status uh, to uh, get the first uh, uh, tranche of, of, uh, of uh, paper towels. But, yeah, I, I get that. So, Mark, I want to, or, or Rod, I want to throw a question at you if I could. Um, you, you were kind of talking about these micromanagers uh, are kind of handicapped a little bit now with uh, virtual, remote kind of working. They can't stand and look over your shoulder. 
and, and, and get 10 minute check-ins, right? Um, so <clears throat> I've been wondering about this myself, is do you think that companies are going to uh, realize the need to upgrade their leadership practices and who gets to be a leader uh, because they may be more exposed now uh, with kind of remote and virtual workplaces because you can't really manage very effectively that way anymore. So I wonder what your thoughts are about what's the impact going to be on uh, leadership and who, who gets to be a leader and how we develop leaders. Well, I would hope coming out of this that uh, once the HR people are through their layoff processing and furlough returns and, and uh, help rationalization and all these kinds of things they've got on their plate that they'll be able to go back and survey their workforce about what worked and what didn't work what felt good what didn't feel good and we'll inventory those almost like an engagement survey but with, with a little more tactical aspect to it yeah. uh, to see exactly what activities worked and didn't work and that's going to expose these these leaders um, and, and I would hope that coming out of that, that, that thinking that this might happen again and, and maybe sooner than later, that a company being prepared for that might need a different kind of leader sitting in that chair. I think we're also, Mark, going to find many situations where people have become better leaders out of this by being in touch and seeing people in their environment, being more sensitive and having more empathy to people working from home or taking off for a kid's activity or letting them work when the work is more flexible and, and usable for them in their life and fitting it in better to their lives. So I, I hope, I hope, uh, although people don't change a lot, but I hope we've got some change going on in some of those leaders through this process as it's tested. And so we'll come out on the other end with some people who have grown through this and some people who I, we've identified um, need a Mark Kinderleiter. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, uh, my kind of last question is technology is king. Uh, so uh, maybe I have a comment more than a question. Boy, is it important now. And I'm, I'm not Mark Johnson. I'm more of a technical zero so i can do enough to get you know uh to do what i the basics uh, so i have to up my game but i think my observation is technology is king only in that it's a tool to help us better connect with people uh and to to do work maybe in a different way uh, maybe i'm throwing that to both of you guys uh, to your uh, about kind of the the importance of technology, but it's not an end game to itself. It's really a set of tools, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree, Mark. And, and yeah, I was fond of seeing that lesson learned from Rod, as you can imagine. <laughs> but yeah, you, your point is, is a great point, Mark. And, and that, you know, I, when I talk to fellow business leaders out there, a lot of times they misunderstand technology's role. And so I hear feedback like, well, we're already spending a lot of money on technology. So it's not about spending a lot of money on technology or spending more money on technology. It's about doing it the right way. It's, it's about the right investments in technology. And there's also a timing component. So the example I always give people is, look at the retail industry. I assure you that Neiman Marcus, Macy's, J. Crew, a lot of these companies that are going out of business right now, they spent money on technology. They didn't spend it as smart as Amazon did. So it's about not just spending money on technology, it's the right technology, the right leadership, and, and the, I call it the window of opportunity. So today, everybody in retail is getting on the bandwagon of online shopping. But a lot of them were late to the game. You know, Amazon had a huge advantage for a period of time because they seized the window of opportunity, were the first one to get there and had a huge market gain because of it. The others now that they're investing in technology, they're not getting any advantage, they're playing catch up. They're just trying to catch up with the guys that left them in the dust. So 
as a business leader, you have to be smart about technology and make sure you're getting the right guidance on the technology. Uh, it's not about just spending money. It's about spending the right money the right way. And as you pointed out, Mark, it's also about thinking through business processes. Don't just go out there and keep spending the money the way you always spend it. Think about what does the, the process change that I need to, 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 to make to make the business run smoother? How can I help my employees work better? And then use technology as the tool to augment all that. So don't just give technology checks out to people and say, well, as a business leader, I've invested in technology. There's more to it than that, and you need the right guidance. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, what you're talking about, Mark, kind of reminds me of one of Rod's lessons that made my head hurt thinking about it for a second, it was managing change is changing. Hmm. Uh, that was utterly profound. It was. That, uh, you know, I've been working off the John Cotter change management model, of, you know, one of the inventors of it from Harvard, where it's kind of this eight uh, step process to managing change. Uh, and, and Rod said uh, really well of, you know, we've got milestones. And so we, we finish that, we celebrate it, we, we have a little uh, sell and we, and we move on, we're done. And we move on to the next thing. Well, your, your point to me was we're never done. So we really do have to think about managing change differently, that it's continuous. Uh, uh, process rather than kind of more initiative uh, specific, which is how I've seen it in my career. Uh, so that's that's one we're going to have to keep getting our head around a little bit. Yeah. So Mark, and I'll put it to both Mark and Rod. There's always there's there's business leaders, even at the CEO level, that are more likely to to be on the front edge of change and lead change, and then there's those that are really reluctant to believe. Hey. I've done it this way for 35, 40 years, and this worked great. How do they how do they change their pace of change, if you will? Do they engage uh, a coach like like the two of you to to help them push through that that uh, reluctance to to rapid change? Or how do you how do we get business leaders to to change their pace of change, if you will? Well, so uh, I think it's. It's industry sector specific as to how how um, motivated they are to embrace change. So, for instance, uh, not a lot has changed in going and, and checking wellheads for leaks and things like that in the field, or going to refinery and doing hydroblasting or vacuum truck work. That probably significantly hasn't changed in twenty or twenty five years. And somebody managing a business like that except for the back office functions of billing and collections and things like that, that have had um, advances in technology, they probably don't feel the pressure to do so. Other businesses like insurance, uh, insurance brokerage firms have probably discovered that they haven't lost a lot of effectiveness by having their meetings and their their calls on people and the data presented in the way they normally presented with conference gets projected on the wall. So I think they're probably in a position to say, what else can we do? How fast can we move? How many, how much can we do with fewer people? Um, which is hard to say in the amount of unemployment that we we're experiencing right now, but it's a reality. So I think uh, industry sector is probably going to be uh, the first thing. But if you have one of those people in one of those sectors that needs to change a lot, then they've got to wrap their heads around being left behind. And what are the consequences of not doing so? What are the un unintended consequences of not embracing technology advancement? And so, um, you know, that's where uh, certainly a Mark Henderlock can come in and, and have them see themselves and be more self-aware of what they're building in as shortcomings with their own people that they're directing. Yeah, I, I thank you for those comments. I, I, you know, I think the big game changer here, Mark, to your question is, um, this change is in our face. Mm. <laughs> you know, and, and Rod's point about it, 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 could, it can be somewhat industry specific. Some industries are hit harder mm. uh, than others. Uh, certainly retail is, uh, hospitality, you know, restaurants, those kind of things where the business is truly face to face you know, in person. Uh, I know a whole lot of professional speakers that 
their bookings are dried up for the for the rest of the year, you know, and they're very talented uh, folks. But, but I think it's two things. One is, my goodness, if you don't realize uh, the need to change with with this Black Swan event, I, I don't know what rock you're living under. Um, <laughs> you won't survive it in business, yeah. frankly. Yeah. Um, uh, the second thing is, uh, is if somebody does realize we've got to pick up the pace of change, but I don't know how to do that because that's kind of not my, my strength, then bring in some help. You know, bring in some help. It could be an executive coach. It could be a technology advisor. You know, it kind of depends on the situation. Uh, but, but good Lord, uh, it's not an option anymore. Uh, the, the saying has been around forever, change or die. It's never been more true. I'm talking about in the business sector. I don't want to be callous about uh, uh, health issues here, but um, but a lot of businesses will die. Um, uh, some through no fault of their own. Uh, it just was a, a set of circumstances that were not survivable, you know. Um, uh, but for others, um, it's how fast do you come? Mark, you and I talked about that a couple episodes ago. How much planning are you doing? Are you setting up teams to, to navigate this thing to including looking forward? Um, and are you, are you just, are you, are you really focusing on coming out of this recovery as absolutely as fast as you can? So that urgency has to be there, but you might need some help uh, to help you do that. Great. So well, we're, we're past our time, and I want to respect everybody's uh, commitment to this meeting. So uh, thank you, Rod, for that great presentation. Thank you, Mark, for uh, your insight, and uh, appreciate everybody joining us today. Thanks for having me. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Take care.